The past 12 months have been challenging for Chesapeake Energy Corporation. It's been a year that has seen a steep decline in the company's market value amid falling energy prices and shareholder unrest. Now a series of media reports raise concerns about the company's future and the leadership style of the man who founded the natural gas giant more than two decades ago. Chesapeake Energy Corporation is clearly a linchpin of Oklahoma's economy. The company, which was founded in 1989, has grown to become the nation's second largest producer of natural gas. Chesapeake employs 12,000 people nationwide, 5,000 of whom work in Oklahoma, with a payroll which totaled nearly $200 million last year and was responsible for $850 million in state and local taxes. The company is also noted for its charitable contributions, doling out $31 million in 2011 alone, including $5.5 million to United Way of Central Oklahoma and a $1 million matching donation to the regional food bank. But in recent months, Chesapeake has been the focus of growing controversy. Earlier this year, the company agreed to pay $1.6 million to three Pennsylvania families for allegedly contaminating water wells while drilling in the Marcellus Shale. At a rally last month, protesters demanded an end to practices they say have resulted in hundreds of environmental violations in Pennsylvania. Some of these violations have been for egregious acts against our environment like improper cement casings which affect our groundwater where people get their drinking water supplies from, yeah. failure to properly store, transport, or dispose residual waste, and discharge of industrial waste and pollution materials into the waters of our commonwealth. But it's the financial dealings of the company and its founder, Aubrey McClendon, that have garnered the greatest media attention in recent months. In April, Reuters reported that McClendon had borrowed $1.1 billion over the past three years, using his ownership in Chesapeake Wells as collateral. Reuters correspondent Anna Land says the loans, some of which came from investment firms that did business with Chesapeake, raised concerns on several levels. He borrowed the money from uh, EIG, Global Energy Partners, which is also a huge source of funding for Chesapeake. They do quite a, a, a number of, of deals with the company and uh, it, it, it raises the question of whether he could be putting his own interests ahead of the shareholders. The loans also raise the issue of whether EIG could be receiving special treatment when dealing with Chesapeake. The Journal Records' Brianna Bailey says McClendon's role in the Founder Well Participation Program upset shareholders of the publicly traded company. It's, it's one thing if Chesapeake were a private company and um, you know there were these interminglings between the company's business and Aubrey McClendon's business, but when you're talking about a public company, you're talking about other people's money. After news of the loan surfaced, Chesapeake's board announced it would end the program and McClendon has since stepped down as chairman with former ConocoPhillips CEO Archie Dunham taking his place on the board. But McClendon retains his position as chief executive officer, and analysts don't anticipate much of a change in the company's direction. Archie Dunham is not an executive, per se, of the company. He is an outside independent director. And uh, so Aubrey McClendon is still, at least for the time being, still very much in charge of Chesapeake. He is the CEO. The Chesapeake story took another turn in May when Reuters reported that McClendon ran a $200 million hedge fund between 2004 and 2008 that traded in the commodities that Chesapeake produces. We talked to a number of companies and a number of compliance officers at, at other energy companies, and most uh, have a, a flat-out ban on trading for their employees. It's, it's a practice that's frowned upon. Reuters correspondent Anna Land says what troubles analysts is that McClendon and Chesapeake co-founder Tom Ward were trading in oil and gas contracts while having access to information that could affect those markets. As you know, Chesapeake is the second largest producer of natural gas. So it raises the question about whether you know, they have information that would have given them an edge trading their own position in, for the hedge fund um, based on, on their knowledge of the company. Land says their investigation uncovered no evidence that inside information was used in the trades, but the revelations contributed to a double-digit decline in the value of the company's stock, 
which has fallen significantly over the past 12 months. Chesapeake's future is also clouded by a cash shortfall that may be as high as $22 billion. One of the strategies they have come up with um, dealing with that is they are uh, selling assets. They've already um, said they were going to sell off their, their pipeline assets, midstream assets, for about $4 billion. And um, outside of that, there are more asset sales to come. Chesapeake's financial troubles stem in part from falling prices for natural gas. As a result, Journal Record reporter Sarah Terry Cobo says the company is repositioning itself as an oil producer. So if they're able to make that switch from dry natural gas to liquid rich and oil plays and the, the price of a barrel of oil and uh, those condensates, what they call liquid rich, are able to stay high, that, that could help pull the company through this. I think it all just depends on natural gas demand and, and what that price is. Kyle Dean is associate director of the Economic Research Policy Institute at Oklahoma City University. He says while lower gas prices do pose challenges for Chesapeake and other producers, he doesn't foresee a crisis in the making. In particular, we have global demand for energy that's just going to continue to increase. Um, we have a global population that is going to be greater than 50% urbanized within the next decade. And so as this continues to occur, the energy use is just only going to uh, increase. But there's little doubt Chesapeake's financial difficulties will reverberate throughout Oklahoma's economy. Think of the hotels, the restaurants where their employees dine, where they shop, um, where landmen and people who work in the field that has a large impact on rural Oklahoma and has the boom town, the rural Oklahoma has really benefited from from the drilling that's happened out there. So if something you know considerable were to happen to Chesapeake, it would have a it would have a ripple effect around the state, not just here in the metro area. Now, a new report from Bloomberg suggests the Oklahoma City real estate market could be the next domino to fall. Chesapeake has spent nearly $450 million on its headquarters campus in northwest Oklahoma City, with construction continuing even as the company struggles to overcome its debt problems. Chesapeake has also paid more than $350 million to develop nearby retail centers, such as the Class on Curve, and to buy up properties in Oklahoma City, including the Caliber Center and Possum Creek office buildings. Local developer Don Karchmer, who declined an on-camera interview, told Bloomberg if something were to happen to Chesapeake, the whole northwestern market would collapse. But whether the company plans to keep those holdings remains unclear. The company officially says that they're not for sale. But with new leadership coming in on the company's board, um, they might, those new directors and um, the new uh, chairman, Archie Denham, might have a different opinion. Billionaire investor Carl Icahn, who owns a 7.5% stake in Chesapeake, is pressuring the company to sell assets not vital to its core energy business. Icahn may also be pushing the stakes higher. He has said uh, publicly that he wouldn't mind seeing the company, you know, sold in its entirety if, uh, you know, a fair offer is out there. So um, we don't know exactly what Carl Icahn's involvement means at this point, but it, it could involve the sale of the company. Steve Bennett produced this story. Steve, what's been the response from Chesapeake? Well, essentially it's been no comment. We made several phone calls and sent emails to Chesapeake as well, asking for some sort of a response. Uh, the replies that I received basically said, due to pending litigation and other factors, Aubrey and the company are not currently providing interviews. I received another interview that says that we are currently not providing interviews about these topics, print or broadcast. So right now, obviously, Chesapeake has decided the best strategy is simply to say nothing at all to the media. How likely is it Chesapeake would actually change hands? Well, that's not very likely. Uh, Southeast Asset Management has expressed confidence in the leadership. Uh, there's been a change right now in the uh, board at Chesapeake. Four new directors have been appointed. And uh, basically, Southeast Asset Management says uh, they're confident that they can move forward now, put these problems behind them. They also say that their image of the uh, leadership issues at uh, Chesapeake uh, doesn't match up with what's been portrayed in the media. So are Chesapeake's problems behind them now? 
No, not really. They're obviously under a lot of pressure right now to sell billions in assets to uh, meet their uh, cash flow shortfall. Uh, in addition, there are SEC and IRS uh, probes right now uh, into the loan program uh, involving those uh, loans that were given to Aubrey McClendon. Uh, in addition, there is a Department of Justice uh, probe right now into allegations that there may have been some sort of collusion to keep land prices down in Michigan. So a lot of problems facing Chesapeake at the moment. However, a lot of shareholders are diehard fans, and they believe that if anybody can turn the company around, it is Aubrey McClendon. Steve Bennett, thanks for that update. Thank you.